Whether robots we see in science fiction movies make life in the future easier or threaten humans. How far has robotics developed in real life? Meet the Da Vinci of robotics, Professor Dennis Hong, who built the first car for blind drivers, which was acknowledged as a result secondary to the moon landing. We will hear about the present and future of robots, an industry that is rapidly growing along with his passionate life, full of positive energy and his dreams. Today we have a world-renowned robotics professor, Dr. Dennis Hong, with us on the show. We'll be discussing the present and future of robot technology, as well as his dreams and passion for the younger generation. Welcome to the show, Dr. Hong. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be in the show. You seem like a person full of energy and passion. Are you always this energetic? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, how can you not be energetic? Uh, so I'm a professor at UCLA. I do robotics. I don't know if you know the story, but uh, when I was seven years old, I watched the movie Star Wars for the very first time, and I've been completely mesmerized by the two robots, r 2 and C-3PO. And that very day, on the way back in the home in the car, I told my mom and dad I'm going to be a robot scientist. I'm here today. I always follow my dream. So I'm living my dream right now. How can you not be excited and energetic? <laughs> well, I'm sure that many kids were excited by Star Wars, yeah. but you became the robot scientist. Yeah. <laughs> and what brought you to Korea this time? So I actually come to Korea very often, about almost uh, uh, once a month. I mean, uh, last time I came to uh, Korea, I came with uh, the UCLA Chancellor, and before that, uh, I came to Korea with uh, our Dean of Engineering. So uh, I come here to do a lot of uh, meetings with uh, collaboration uh, meetings, research meetings. I also come here to inspire the young generation. I have a very a strong uh, interest and love towards the Korean young generation uh, in science and engineering. And of course, when I come here, I do a lot of lectures too. However, this time, there's a secret. There's another reason why I actually came to Korea. So as I mentioned, uh, Star Wars is very, very, the movie Star Wars is very dear to my heart. And there's a new movie, uh, Episode 7 opening. In the States, it opens on the 17th. In Korea, it opens 36 hours earlier. So I actually came here to Korea to, to watch Star Wars before watch. all my friends back in the United States. Wow, that's very exciting. <laughs> yes. So let's uh, talk about robots. Sure, yeah. Your major field. Mm -hmm. So how far are we in terms of robot technology? Oh, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I'm, I'm actually a little bit of a pessimist. Um, the more I do research, the more I study in robotics, I constantly learn how far we are from the robots that we know and love from science fiction. Uh, for example, like uh, in our lab, my lab is called Romela, the Robotics and Mechanisms Laboratory, and we have so many visitors who come to our lab, from adults to kids, we have so many people. Now when the kids come to our lab, I show them robots walking and doing really exciting things, and everybody's so excited. But after about a few minutes, they say, but why can't your robot run around? Why can't your robot do this? Why can't it do that? And I tell them, oh, no, we don't have that technology yet, and we're really uh, working on it right now. And they say, no, 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 I saw it last week. Of course, they saw it last week in the movies and science fiction. So because of these science fiction movies and everything, the general public has too much of a high expectation of robots. I mean, open the, uh, the newspaper. Uh, in the TV news, they always talk about robots taking away our jobs. We're going to talk more about that, I think, in the, in the program. And the, the general public has such a high expectation, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, we currently are focusing on a, a class of robots called disaster relief robots, which I, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit more. These robots are humanoid robots that walk with two feet, but these robots, they can't really walk with two feet steadily. They constantly fall down. Like if I tell my robot to pick up this cup, it can't. Human beings can. <laughs> Human beings can. Humans are like you know. It's 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 insane how how you know it's how much how difficult it is for robots to do all the things that we dream about. So we have a long way to go. But because of that, we are working very hard. Well, where is Korea then? At, at what stage of robot technology? And robotics. Uh, yeah. So in, in general, when the general public thinks that the, the, the number one country in the, the world in robotics is Japan, of course, Japan they have great technology, but most of their robots are. Uh, what should I say? It's, it's, it's very presentable. They look cool. They did the demonstration. They have a very interesting ways of showing off their technology. They, they, they deliver coffee. They play the trumpet and those kind of things. In Korea, we have, in Korea, we have brilliant scientists and engineers working on, roboticists working on these big problems. 
if I become a little bit critical, uh, one thing that's lacking is a little bit of creativity, I should say. Uh, brilliant minds, hardworking researchers, but there's not a whole lot of brand new, new things in robotics in, in Korea. However, one interesting thing is uh, Korea is a little bit unique. There's really a big opportunity here, so that's what I want to mention. Uh, Korea has a very, very strong infrastructure in ICT. ICT meaning information and communication technology. You know, for example, uh, you, if you live in Korea, you probably don't realize how fast of an internet you guys have. It's amazing. Every time I come to Korea, suddenly all my computers and PDAs and everything just work really, really fast. Now, robotics are, robots are machines, uh, and they, they have a computer. They need to communicate. Another big... Uh, uh, topic in robotics these days is called cloud robotics. Instead mm -hmm. of having all the uh, information processed locally on the robot, it's connected to the cloud or the internet. And with this brilliant infrastructure, uh, there's a really, really excellent opportunity for a new type of robots in Korea. So there is potential. Yes, absolutely. Big potential. Yeah. yeah. Another big potential is not just the infrastructure, but the people, the young generation in Korea. I mean, I come here to talk to students and kids and uh, the, the young generation, and it's amazing how much love and passion they have towards robotics. And those genera young generation, when they grow up, when they become uh, the, the scientists and engineers, Korea has a beautiful future, bright future. Oh, now. that's good to know, mm -hmm. good to hear. And actually, my son is a big fan of yours. Oh, is he? Oh, okay, good. You should have brought him here today. <laughs> um, your name, Dennis Hong, mm -hmm. became very famous mm -hmm. with Brian as a car for the uh, visually impaired people. Tell yes. us a little more about Brian. Uh, yeah, so Brian is a special car. It's not a robotic car. It's a special car where a, bl a blind person can make active decisions and drive. So let's go back to 2007. In 2007, there was a competition called the DARPA Urban Challenge. Now, DARPA, as you probably know, is the research wing of the Department of Defense in the United States. And it was a competition. At the time, that was the largest, grandest, the most challenging robotics competition in the history of mankind. It was a competition for people to build robotic cars that can uh, drive in the urban environment, obeying the rules of the road. Now, in that competition, we placed third place and won half a million dollars, so it was a huge success. Now, before that, when you talk to people, do you think we'll have fully autonomous cars? People said, like, yeah, maybe in the future I've seen in science fiction, but they didn't believe that it's going to be a reality in their lifetime. But after that competition, people start to accept that, wow, people actually have this technology. So the National Federation of the Blind, or NFB, saw this and they said, wow, if this is the case, maybe the engineers have technology to build a car that a visually impaired person can actually drive. So they opened up a competition called the Blind Driver Challenge. And we, we, uh, we challenged it and we developed the very first car for the visually impaired. Well, it was a great achievement, yes, not only is. for the science, but also uh, for good cause. Oh, absolutely. I guess. Yeah. So I mean, this is what we are doing. This is why we do things. Um, so this car is not a robotics car. We're using, so we already developed a robotic car from the DARPA Urban Challenge. We're using robotics technology and use it for areas which are not robots, but to help people in need, the visually impaired people. So it's really to give them independence, to give them freedom, and to give them happiness. And that's what we're doing. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And next came Charlie. It was uh, autonomous humanoid robot. Uh, yeah, so. Sounds very <laughs> difficult for a layperson uh, like myself. So, I mean, I think, I think just the, movie, the robots that we've seen in science fiction, that's what we're doing. So Charlie stands for Cognitive Humanoid Autonomous Robot with Learning Intelligence. All my robots are acronyms. So this is considered the United States' very first full-size, adult-sized humanoid robot. Now, humanoid robots, uh, when I say a robot, what comes into your mind? Do you see the walking thing? Like, machine. Walking machine? Yeah, so, so that, that's it. So when, when I say robots, normally people think uh, uh, a robot that looks like, like humans. humans. Two legs, torso, head, and two arms. We call those humanoid robots. Most of the time, uh, the robots are depicted in, and in Hollywood movies in humanoid form. So we want to build those kind of robots, and Charlie is considered one of the very first. Uh, Charlie, well... Uh, if I be completely honest, it's actually not that much of a significant breakthrough in technology, but it was the very first of its kind, and we developed it uh, in a, a very lightweight and low cost, and that was another very huge impact. 
So when, what was your main focus when you were developing Charlie? Was mm. there any particular features? Oh yeah, sure. So uh, talking about humanoid robots in general. Now, even in the robotics field, a lot of people, uh, you know, d don't agree on the why we need humanoid robots. I'm trying to make a robot walk with two feet ridiculously difficult. I mean, we take it for granted. We walk with two feet all the time. But robots with walking with two feet, it's very difficult. Trying to make these hands make it look like you know humans. It's wh why do we need human robots? Now there's a there's many reasons why we need human robots. I can mm -hmm. talk for hours about this, but quickly uh, I'll just talk about two points. The first thing is that we um, uh, our group develops human robots to understand us humans better. That for example, I briefly mentioned that uh, uh, walking with two feet is not only difficult, but even the scientists don't perfectly understand how we walk with two feet. We do not understand the true mechanics. So in the process of developing robots that can walk with two feet, we get to understand us humans better, and we can use that knowledge for, for example, developing better prosthetic legs or medical uh, applications. Another more practical reason why we do human robots is, uh, so I have a dream. In the future, I would like to have a butler robot in my home. A robot can do the laundry, take out the trash, uh, uh, you know, uh, do all the uh, chores. Many people's dream. We, yeah, would you like to have one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so if this robot needs to live with us in this environment designed by humans for humans, I claim a robot needs to be human size and for human form. The reason is this. When you walk on stairs, walk upstairs or walk downstairs, there's a reason why your stair is such a height because it's designed for humans to walk up and down. When you open the door, there's a reason why your door handle is certain height. It's for uh, humans to open up, open up the door. So unless the robot is a human shape and size, it won't be able to navigate this environment or use tools designed for humans. Eventually, you want your robot to drive your car, operate machinery, and unless the robot is a human form, it won't be able to do that. So that's why we're developing humanoid robots. It sounds like you are trying to narrow the gap between science fiction and the reality. Uh, 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 yes and no. Uh, many times, again, as I mentioned, I was inspired by the movie Star mm -hmm. Wars, and that's been my dream. Uh, however, sometimes uh, 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 the science fiction movies have uh, not the most positive applications, like probably you've seen the uh, robot Terminators. Or so those are kind of things we want to widen the gap, <laughs> not, uh, not uh, narrow the so gap. I, I've heard that you've also developed robots for disaster relief, oh, yes, like yes. Sapphire or Thor. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Sapphire is, uh, stands for Shipboard Autonomous Firefighting Robot. This is a multi-million dollar project. That's for firefighting. Firefighting, yeah, funded by the U.S. Navy. So this is a robot that's going to be used on Navy ships to fight fires together with firefighters. That was a big success. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we had our first successful demonstration. There's a ship called USS Shadwell, and actually on the Navy ship, we actually really had a fire, and our robot Sapphire and firefighters actually successfully put out the fire. It's gonna have a huge impact. Another project, uh, the robot called THOR, THOR, Tactical Hazardous Operations Robot. I told you all robots have acronyms. This is a robot for disaster relief, as you mentioned. Uh, I think it's almost, been four years already in Japan. Uh, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident, it was a horrible tragedy. A lot of people died and even now oh it's my. a big, big problem. Uh, the last year the Japanese government invited me with some other scientists to actually uh, go into the nuclear power plant uh, uh, reactor at Fukushima. I, I re really, I, I felt like I was risking my life to go in there. Why? To really develop technology to help people to really, if I may, I'm not exaggerating, it's really to save humanity. That's and right. we're going to have these disasters, man-made natural disasters, and we need technology to, uh, you know, solve that. So when you're developing technology, unless you actually uh, um, talk and interact with the people working there and actually see with your eyes in the actual, uh, the site, you cannot develop effective technology. That was, that's why I was there. And while there, uh, one of the experts told us that for the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident, in the first 24 hours, if somebody could have just opened one valve, mm. we could have prevented everything. Oh. But because of the radiation, people cannot go. So what do we do? We develop robots to do that. So Thor is one of the robots to be used in those kind of situations. It's a humanoid robot, as you talked about. Uh, um, it's about 178 meters, uh, centimeters tall, uh, 68 kilograms. Same hat, height as me, much, much lighter than me. I, I need a diet. <laughs> but it's a robot that can climb stairs, drive cars, operate valves, uh, use power tools, and it's a robot that will save humanity.
That sounds really important. It is very important, yes. yes. By the way, I like the names of your robots. Is it uh, cool? It yeah. sounds, sounds cool. Actually, we spend more time on making the names than actually doing research <laughs> on robots. <laughs> um, so, where do you go from here? What are the, your future plans? Any, any future plans you can share sure. with us? Uh, so, I, I don't know if you knew, but I've been a professor at Virginia Tech for 11 years. And a year and a half ago, UCLA stole me from Virginia Tech. And now I'm at UCLA. There's a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, we're building a brand new robotics institute. A lot of exciting things. So, of course, yes, we're continually uh, developing disaster relief robots and human robots, but there's a lot of other new opportunities. Now, UCLA has a fantastic medical school and one of the world's top medical uh, uh, facilities and hospitals. So, naturally, I think there's a lot of good uh, potential for medical robotics. But another interesting thing is there's Hollywood next door. And uh, there's a new field called entertainment robotics, and we have a lot of really, really, really cool ideas to do those kind of things. I'm gonna, not going to spill all the beans, but uh, uh, in one day we had 10 patents, but for example. Uh, we're doing really, really great work, and we want to surprise you. Now, invite me again about a year <laughs> later, and I'll bring the robots and show we're you. We're expecting <laughs> it. Uh, actually, yes. while I'm hearing what you're saying right mm -hmm. now, I find that robots can be a lot more versatile than I imagined. Mm -hmm. So where do you get all this creativity? How do you just... Uh, where the ideas come yeah, from? Uh, where the ideas yeah, come? I mean, ideas can come from everywhere. Anyway, even today when I was walking into the studio, I saw all these cameras. I don't know if you saw it, but I was constantly looking around, looking at this jig and all those kind of things. I'm naturally a very curious person. I look around and see things and I get ideas. Uh, but most of the ideas come, uh, you know, when I go to bed, so I go to bed at 4 a.m. I sleep really, really late. Wow. So <laughs> when I, oh yeah, uh, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. So when I go to bed, when I'm about to fall asleep, I do that. In my head, I see these weird shapes floating around, changing colors, and they assemble, and they come up with some really cool things. Now, many times it's junk, but while I'm doing that, suddenly I see that something like, whoa, this is cool. And then at 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, next to my bed, I have this small notebook and a special pen that has a small light because I don't want to uh, wake up my wife's living. So, <laughs> and it's like, right, right, right ah, and I go to bed. So every day, every single day when I wake up in the morning, before I brush my teeth, before I have my first cup of coffee, the first thing I do is to open up my notebook next to my bed and try to see if there's anything that I've written or drawn. Now, many times it's empty. Many times it's gibberish or things like that. It doesn't make sense. I mean, it's 4 a.m. in the morning. What do you expect? <laughs> but sometimes I see genius inside. I was looking at that. Whoa, this is it. This is cool. Then I just run to my office. I type it up. I sketch it in a nicely and I put it in the database. So I keep my notebook idea database and try to do that. Uh, that's another inspiration. But again, as I mentioned, um, ideas come from everywhere, anywhere. Uh, a very actually well-known story about uh, uh, one of the robots. There's a robot called Strider, self-excited tripedal. A uh, uh, leg experimental robot. It looks like a camera tripod, so it has three legs. You actually have to see uh, the video. I might, uh, you know, we might show it in the, the TV. So it has three legs, and one of the legs swings between the two legs and catches the fall, mm -hmm. and another leg swings between the leg and catches the fall, and it walks in a very interesting way. It's been a very, very uh, successful robot. Now, the inspiration for that robot, do you know where it came from? <laughs> I am not joking, when I was a graduate student uh, and after studying I wanted to take a break so I was walking in the park. I was sitting on a park bench and next to my bench there was an old lady braiding her daughter's, I, I assume it was her daughter, <laughs> hair. And you've seen braiding hair, right? Ah, three strands three of hair, strands. one strand goes between the two yes. and one, so she was doing that. Now of course I've seen braided hair before but that was the first time seeing the process. At that time, I always, as I mentioned, uh, bring a notebook and a pencil, so I sketched that process. Of course, I was not thinking about robots. You know, I was not thinking about anything. It was just, every time I see anything cool, I write it down. After 10 years, I became a professor, and the Navy, the, the Office of Naval Research, they had a call for proposal for new type of locomotion robots. And as I always do, I take out my idea notebook, which you'll look through and look at things, and then suddenly, 10 years ago, that sketch of braiding, the, I saw that. And then suddenly the hair strands start to look like legs. Ah. And that's how Strider was born. So for me, ah. inspiration comes from everywhere, anywhere. Uh, at nighttime when I'm walking, a few days ago I was having coffee with a friend. And at cafe there was a, uh, a candlestick. And when the candle, when the, the, the molten wax comes down, there's an interesting geometry to catch the wax. Mm -hmm. And I saw that and I, I put it on my notebook and that could be a potentially 
uh, some kind of robot mechanism for catching the, the, the uh, degrees. Another interesting thing is I, I have a lot of friends. Uh, one of our friends, a musician, uh, the Korean traditional uh, uh, music uh, musician called Kayagum. Kayagum, yes. yeah. yeah. So Kayagum, she plays the Kayagum. And he was showing me how they change the, the pitch. Now, a violin or a cello, what do you do? You, you turn this knob. Uh, there's a technical, I forgot the name, but you do that to change the tension of the string. Mm -hmm. uh, in Kayagum, uh, when you have the string, there's a, a, a thing that looks like an upside down V mm -hmm. or a shield, right? Yeah. And you move it this way. I mean, you're familiar with that. And she was showing me that, and that was fascinating. So I actually took a video of ding, 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 like that. So, Later on, uh, we were developing this new type of robot. It's a six-leg robot that's as big as a car. It's for demining, which I didn't talk about. It's a secret <laughs> project. But uh, we need to develop a special uh, uh, test rig to test the leg. And one of the mechanisms we needed to is to change the tension of a cable. So guess what we did? We Kayagum. use that <laughs> Kayagum mechanism to do that. It's in our lab, and we use that to uh, actually use it. So again, this is another good example that we, I get inspired for every day, everything. Wow. Yeah. So once you have that good idea mm -hmm. and inspiration, yes. R&D should follow. <coughs> mm -hmm. So how do you get funding? How do you get funding for your research? Uh, sure. So it's just an idea doesn't mean that it's directly applicable to research. Right. Um, now, when for me, when I have an idea, as I mentioned, braiding hair or this Kayagum thing, the idea itself has no meaning until it meets this application. Braiding hair was an interesting sketch. But when it met our need to develop a new type of locomotion robot, only then it became a really new robot ro mechanism. The, the, the Kayagum thing itself you know, had nothing to do with me, but when I actually uh, put it together to this mechanism, it st started to have meaning. So my job as a professor is, of course, I teach, I uh, advise our students, but a lot of times uh, the idea comes from, uh, starts from me, and we further develop through a, a, a brainstorming discussion with our students in our group. And then based on that, we write a research proposal. Now, to get funding, so we, we're in a university as a research lab. So it's not like, uh, it's not like those venture capital, you know, the startup thing. Uh, faculty, we, if we have an idea, if there's a call for proposal from funding agencies like the National Science Foundation, NSF or DARPA, DOD, uh, NS, uh, uh, ONR, we rewrite a research proposal and we submit it. And after a review, if you get uh, accepted, then you get research funding. And that's research funding is used for paying the students as research assistantship, buying the materials and all those kind of things. So that's how we operate. Do you and also get funded by the pr private sector as well? Uh, not really. Uh, in the past, a little bit. But uh, again, this is my just personal uh, uh, style. Uh, many times when you get uh, um, tied up with uh, private sector funding, you, you lose freedom. Uh, freedom is very important for me. I would like to explore my ideas and I would like to realize things that I truly believe that has value, that's going to change the world for the better, and that's what I do. Many times when you work with a company, because it's business, uh, you lose a lot of those freedom of selection and direction and also publication and those kind of things. Because if I come up with something new, I would like to discipline. I want the people, the world to know. I want companies to use this technology. Uh, if I work with a company, it's a little bit different. Well, to put it differently, I think it's your research is important enough and public enough to mm. be funded by the national you know, budget and so on, oh, yeah, that's yeah, what rather than private yes. sector. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in a really lay person's term, mm -hmm. I'm curious how much time or how much money does it cost to develop a single robot? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's very difficult to say because it all depends. There's some small robots, gigantic robots, multi-million robots, a few hundred dollars even. You know, it's not like, oh, let's start today and end today. It's constantly evolving. Like uh, even our robot 4, the disaster relief robot, started from a small robot called Darwin. It's constantly evolving. So it's really difficult to say, but it has a wide, wide range in terms of the cost from a few hundred K to multi-million dollars, even the you know, six month project to a three, four, five year project. So it all depends. And it also involves many people. As oh yeah, well, of course. I am so proud of our students. We have a brilliant group. I love my students. Uh, our group is, it's, I cannot say, you know, they're great, I would say. Yeah, I so. see. So you've been doing this, developing new technology uh, directly or indirectly mm -hmm. related with robotics. Mm -hmm. Um, have you developed a kind of philosophy over the years in this regard? Well, <laughs> philosophy is a pretty big word uh, as a foreign engineer. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would say that. Like, um, okay, let's talk about things. So, I, let's talk about the human robots, for example. As I mentioned, these robots. <clears throat> 
walk with two legs and they're unstable, they constantly fall. And some of these robots are really, really expensive. Now, there's a lot of other fantastic research labs who do similar uh, uh, work, but what sets us apart, our Romela, our lab apart is, uh, when you have these one, these, these are prototypes, these are one of a kind, there's only one in the world, and they're very expensive. So when you do experiments, you want to be really, really careful. Oh, don't break, don't push it too much. You know, you want to maintain it nice, and you don't want to break it because it's only you have one. In our lab, it's different. I tell, tell our students to, Push the limit. I want them to break the robot. Make it go faster. Mm -hmm. Make it lift more heavy payload. Do this, do that. Let's push the limit. And I want the students to break the robot because if your robot doesn't break and does not fall, you don't learn anything. And it's the same with people too. I see. So that's our philosophy, if I may. <laughs> I see. Yeah. It's a very uh, a sort of aggressive approach in yeah. sort of extending the ability we want, of we the, want the, the students robots. To push, yeah. yeah. I yeah. see. Yeah. Push to the limit. Mm -hmm. uh, um, well, some people are worried that mm -hmm. further advancement of robotics technology mm -hmm. might take job opportunities away from human beings. Yes. And they're against the, the development of robot technology. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, especially these days, uh, newspapers and magazines, there's a lot of articles talking about robots taking away our jobs. Of course, you know what, this is actually not new, surprisingly, since the, what, the 18th century and the, the Industrial Revolution, uh, once we start to have these machines, steam-powered engines, it started to take away jobs for the, you know, in the industry. And you probably know about the Luddite movement. People actually try to like, destroy, there's a movement for destroying machines. So, I mean, machines taking away jobs is nothing new. It's been happening since the 18th century. Uh, yes, the rate will be accelerating because now we have intelligent robots. I mean, your car, did you know that your car is actually built by robots in a factory? No. no robots build <laughs> all the spot welding. Your car is built by robots. So uh, through automation, we try to use robots to do that. So it's really nothing uh, really new, but of course the rate is accelerating. But in my personal opinion, I think a lot of things are very exaggerated. As I mentioned, we still have a long way to go. Now, when you talk about robots, there's a robot hardware, the, the physical, the machine the part, and there's a brain which is called software. Now, software is you know, developing, accelerating really, really fast because, I mean, when you talk about, let's talk about your smartphone. Your current smartphone, and two years ago of a smartphone, it's, it's completely different. You have brand right. new technology. But talk about your car, two years ago car, years ago car and this, these, the, today's car, they're almost the same because software or the information, ICT, communication technology, they accelerate really fast, but the hardware does not improve that quickly because it needs to follow the, the laws of physics, F equals MA, you know, those laws of physics. So we cannot, you know, accelerate that much. These days, we're seeing a breakthrough in artificial intelligence, or as you call it, AI. You probably heard the buzzwords called like big data, machine learning, and all those kind of things. Uh, uh, so yes, AI is working really, you know, uh, uh, accelerating really fast, but the actual hardware doesn't follow that kind of path. So I don't think it's, you know, it's, uh, yes, we should think about it. It's important for us to be responsible to think about this problem, but in my opinion, it's very much e exaggerated. Now, that being said, um, this is also my personal opinion. I think that you know, when robots take away jobs, it's actually gonna start taking away jobs that people should not be doing or cannot do. Like disaster relief. Yes, exactly. So we call it the 3D, dull, dirty, dangerous, dull work. You know, things that you don't want to do, mundane, you know, you know, assembly line worker, uh, dirty, you know, taking out the trash and all those kind of dangerous work, uh, you know, working, using these robots for disaster relief and those kind of things. Now, for example, let's say this is the future, okay, this is future, and we're looking back today, the, the present, so if I'm a person in the future, I will say that if there's a job that a robot took, took the job, the work, I will probably say this, wow, in 2016, a long time ago, People actually used to do this? That's insane, it's so inhumane. I think those are the jobs that robots will start taking over, which is actually a positive thing. The second thing is, I also believe, yes, robots will take, you know, take away jobs, but I think it's gonna create more jobs than what it takes away. Good example, the automotive industry, cars. Before we had automobiles, did we have gas stations? Did we have car insurance salespeople? Did we have, you know, car dealers or mechanics, all of this new sector of job is created because of this new industry. 
I hope and I think, I believe that with the, when robots really become widespread, we're going to have all these type of new jobs that probably we, we don't even cannot think of right now. So in that case, we should be thankful for the development of robotics. So that's what we're working hard to do. Though. I see, yeah. I see. Um, you put the source technology of Darwin, the humanoid robots, mm -hmm. on the internet yes. to share with others. Yes. Um, how did you come up with that decision mm -hmm. when you can probably make profit out of your yeah, yeah. So, so for the general audience, so Darwin is a miniature humanoid robot. Uh, Darwin stands for Dynamic Anthropoid Robot with Intelligence. I told you all of my robots are good names. So Darwin is a very special robot. We started uh, developing this robot since 2004, so it's been constantly evolving. Now, Darwin is a, uh, a robot for research and education. It became a huge hit. Now, once the Darwin started from Darwin 0, Darwin 1, Darwin 2, and when Darwin 4 was born, we published papers with demonstrations. We started to get a lot of phone calls and emails from people from all around the world, especially research labs and universities, that they wanted to want us to sell this robot because this is the most fantastic robot for research and education. But these robots that we developed, these are really expensive, cost of a car. And it's very difficult to handle, very dangerous. And I was in a university, so I couldn't sell it. So I wrote a research proposal to the National Science Foundation in the United States, NSF. And I proposed that we're going to develop a new type of robot for research and education called Darwin OP. OP stands for Open Platform. Now, I'm sure you heard about open source. Have you heard about the term open source? So now, open source, we, we often use for software. Uh, for example, I create a new piece of software. Instead of selling it, I put the source code on the internet so yes. everybody can use for free. Now, Darwin OP is not only open source software, but also the hardware is open source. All the blueprints, CAD files, uh, the, the, uh, the, where to buy the materials, where to buy the components, how to fabricate the parts, how to put it together, everything we put it online for free. So other people can make the yes. same thing. Now, no, when no. I told that to my friends and family and my colleagues, you know, you know, I'm not that you know, interested in money, money stuff, but my friends are starting to like, poke me, hey, Dennis. You know, Professor Hong, why are you trying to put this on for free? I mean, if you sell this, you can be a billionaire. Just to get the license, you can be rich. And then it starts to scratch my head. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So maybe I should, maybe I should not. And I got confused. Now, now this is not related to robots, but when in my personal life, you know, many times you, you face a very difficult decision. You don't know where you should go this way or that way. Whenever I have this difficult uh, situation, I always ask myself a question. And then when I ask this question to myself, it always gives me the right answer, like magic. I'm not kidding. Do you know what the question is? The question is, why did I start this in the first place? Mm -hmm. That's the question. So the same thing. Should I make this open source or should I sell it? And I asked myself, why did I start this robotics Darwin project in the first place? Ah, it's for research and education. So the answer is clear. So we decided to put it online for free. And then the impact was huge. In less than a year, more than 300 units are being used worldwide. Now thousands of units are using, being used. If you go to like international robotics conferences, there are so many uh, new papers and publications, new research, new algorithms developed because of this robot. So I consider this as a gift to the robotics community. And it's like my son that I really, really uh, it's dear to my heart. Oh, I see. Yeah. You are also called Da Vinci of robotics, <laughs> uh, Leonardo Da Vinci. Yes. I couldn't think of a better honor, uh. you know, if you work <laughs> in this in the field, you call Da Vinci. But I also realized that Da Vinci made many mistakes, uh -huh. and a lot of his projects were not finished. Uh -huh. Have you had such a case? Oh, sure. Now, first of all, the, 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 the clarify thing. The Leonardo da Vinci of robots was first coined by Washington Post magazine. So they first called me the Leonardo da Vinci of robots. The reason, if I might speculate, I am interested in many different things. Like, uh, yeah, Leonardo da Vinci man, right? He's a philosopher, he's an artist, he's an engineer scientist. So I also have a lot of interest in different fields. So that's why I believe, I would like to believe that's, that's why I'm called the da Vinci of robots. But that being said, of course, everybody fails, everybody mistakes. I'm the same too. Uh, now, the general public, I have a big following, especially people who like science and engineers. And it's interesting that the general public only wants to see the success part. They want to see, they, they, they're excited to see these robot creations and right. technology, okay. but they don't really try to see what's going behind. Like, I wrote a book called Robot Da Vinci Kumar's uh, Hargyada. In that book, I specifically try to focusing focus on the failures because it's important to know that you know pe successful people fail. I know personally know a lot of successful people, but I do not know a single person who hasn't failed. Everybody fails. 
The difference is if you, when you, once you fail and you give up, then that's the end. But if you learn from your mistakes, that becomes a stepping stone to reach to the next success. And that's what we're doing. Uh, in some of the, the recent competition called the DARPA Robotics Challenge, uh, we didn't do very well. And I told the students, uh, you can't always win, but you can always learn. And that's the lesson that I want to give the students. So you have many names to go by. Mm -hmm. You are a professor at UCLA. Yes. You are also the founding director of Romella mm -hmm. Lab. Mm -hmm. and, and the and father of Ethan. The father of Ethan. The husband of my beautiful wife. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's yes. right. In many, many mm -hmm. capacities. And also I heard that you want to be a chef or you want to oh, design uh, a, a roller coaster, yeah, 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 yeah. so many things. Yeah. In which role you would be uh, most satisfied. Yes, so again, I told you that my dream was to be a robot scientist and I always followed my dream since seven years old. I'm here today, which is true. But a lot of people know me as a robot scientist. But I also have three more dreams and I'm still following those dreams. Uh, another dream is to become, as you mentioned, a chef. Uh, I cook at home every single day. Uh, uh, I love cooking. Now for me, cooking is a uh, outlet for creativity. So every day, after work, when I come back home, I stop by the farmer's market or grocery store, and I just buy whatever's fresh at the spot. When I come home, I spread it out of the kitchen. And at that instant, I try to improvise. Like, I don't plan ahead. I'm not gonna, mm, I'm gonna you know, make spaghetti carbonara. I don't think that way. I just buy whatever fresh, and I improvise. And that's fun, because if you understand the cooking process, and if you truly understand the, the, the properties of the, the, uh, the ingredients, then you can actually plan or design your cuisine. So I think, oh, I'm gonna do this, I visualize this, and I think, okay, when the, the food is done, when I eat it, the texture becomes crunchy and this flavor comes in, and I try to imagine that. So when I'm done with the food, the favorite part, of course, is to share it with your loved ones and to yes. enjoy it. But another, as a scientist and engineer, is what I really enjoy is when I actually eat that food, and if the result matches what I predicted, I get this, Ah, moment, and that's cool. I really like that. So yes, chef. I still cook. Oh, by the way, I was. Do you know the program uh, Master Chef? Yes. Uh, Master Chef U Master Chef USA. I was on season four. Oh wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you know Gordon Ramsay? <laughs> yes. Gordon Ramsay said he ate my dish. I said, Dennis, you are brilliant. You are genius. Oh, wow, that's great. But I got so, cut. <laughs> you're not, so you not only enjoy it, you are good at it. Oh yeah, I would like to. And the best yeah. thing is you can eat the outcome of yes, your share the creativity. <laughs> Uh, uh, magician is in the magic is in the big passion. Again, I also uh, started that uh, hobby since I was seven years old. Now, back I, when I grew up in Korea a long time ago, magic didn't exist. I mean, this type of entertainment for magic didn't exist. My dad, he traveled a lot, and whenever he came back to, uh, internationally, when he came back, he bought these like you know those like kids uh, you know, magic kit, you know the, the, the cheesy stuff. But I showed it to my friends at school and everybody, this is the first time people say like, like, wow, that's cool. So after that, I asked my dad to buy more of these like uh, magic things and they start actually studying magic. I start to this, uh, this, uh, study a theory and these days, I actually, the, most of the magic trick I do is invented by me. I create my own magic. I've been on TV a few times. Uh, in Korea, there's the Dongnang uh, Yesulje. It's the biggest uh, the, the, uh, the competition in Korea. I've been uh, the first place winner uh, through my magic, so I'm pretty passionate. When I was at Virginia Tech, I used to give lectures on the science and psychology behind magic. So I still follow that. I think I see some cross-cutting theme mm. in the things that you do, creativity. Yes. <laughs> yeah, two things, creativity, creativity there's another passion. thing, passion there's another thing. Yeah. So again, uh, before I do that, the last thing is uh, designing uh, 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 rides and theme parks, which I'm really passionate. I'm also involved with certain uh, projects, even in Korea there's a uh, uh, place called Robot Land. I'm helping consulting and I'm helping them and I'm most likely to be working with Disney for their new Star Wars theme park, but that's a different story. But So those four things, robots, scientist, a chef, a magician, and a theme park ride designer. Not, there's a, you know, a, there's a, a common thing. You talked about creativity, yes, passion, yes, but there's actually a more important thing. I didn't realize this until I you know, wrote my book. While I'm writing this, my book, I wrote the you know, chef, magician, robot, and then <laughs> I was thinking, this is weird, like chef, robot scientist, it's all over the place. There must be something that connects it, and I found it. Do you know what that is? All these four things is to make people happy. I develop robotics technology to benefit the society. I cook food so I can enjoy with my friends and family. Magic tricks to people, wow, entertain people. I want people to ride my theme park rides and enjoy. And I think that's it. I make people happy and while doing that, I become happy. 
and that's what I do. Right? So to sum it up, uh, being happy is important. Oh, of course, of course. And um, would you call yourself a happy person? I, yeah, and I can in say one that. sentence, why? Why? Uh, so that becomes a little more philosophical thing. Uh, now, depends on your religion, if you're a religious person, or depending on your lifetime philosophy. For me, if somebody asks what's my ultimate goal in life, it's actually simple. I'm, I, I'm in this world not because I wanted to, not for my will, but I just, I, I, you know, I, my mom and dad decided to make me and I'm here. It's, my life is given to me. While I'm living on earth, in this world, I would like to maximize my happiness. Now, that might sound a little bit like, hmm, Dennis just wants to maximize his happiness. Yeah, that is true. I want to maximize my happiness. But the interesting thing for me is I become happy when I make people happy. And that's what I want to do. That's Simple great. As that. That's great. Yeah. I guess it's all the time we got. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you for the great interview. Thank, <laughs> thank you for being here. Yes, yes. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you. Yeah.